let's get started. Now, my name is Will Vanderlinden. I'm uh, here with ITS. I'm on the security team. I'm a certified technical specialist for semantic as well as an authorized semantic consultant. Our security team here is focused on a few products, and those include DLP, data loss prevention, encryption, critical system protection, as well as SEP. And today we're going to be talking about SEP. Uh, a little bit about uh, ITS partners before we go on. We are uh, exclu uh, focus, focused exclusively on the endpoint. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do, uh, more than just security, there's also asset management and so forth. We've been doing this for over 10 years, and because of that, and because of our track record, we've got uh, quite a few uh, accolades from Semantic, including Partner of the Year for three years, you can see there on the screen. We're also a National Partner and a Platinum Partner, and a Master Specialized Partner. We are a recognized leader in deploying Semantic solutions. We have among our customers several of uh, the top uh, U.S. Fortune 500 companies. So let's get started with SEP 12.1. Uh, semantic Endpoint Protection combines traditional virus and spyware protection with advanced threat pre uh, prevention, and that delivers unmatched defense against malware for your laptops, desktops, servers, and virtual environments. But it goes beyond just basic antivirus software. This is a seamless integration of essential security technologies. Semantic endpoint protection, well, we just call it SEP from now on, combines advanced endpoint protection into a single client. And that's important from a cost uh, uh, point of view. A single client, and it's all managed by a single unified management console, and we'll call that the SEPM. This is the Semantic Endpoint Protection Manager. The individual technologies that are used in the endpoint protection are the virus and the spyware protection. Of course, we expect that. Uh, sonar, that's a real-time protection mechanism that detects potentially malicious applications when they run on your computer. Application and device control, this is part of the advanced protection approach. Uh, application control contains security rules and settings on the computer running SEP, and that protects uh, registry settings, uh, protects specified directories and files, it can control processes, DLLs, uh, application execution, and so forth. The device control uh, portion of this controls the transfer of data to or from unauthorized removable media devices uh, like a USB flash drive or a CD burner or, or other common things. Um, you, you, can, you can enable or disable an entire class of devices, but it gets a little more granular than that and that you can while you may, for example, say I want I want to disable all USB devices, but you can declare a USB flash drive, for example, as an uh, enterprise approved device, and then go back and enable just that device. So it does get pretty granular. The firewall is a client-side firewall, so it's an application-based and it's stateful packet inspection. It looks very much, or the rules uh, set looks very much like you would expect a, a firewall to look like. The intrusion prevention, uh, sometimes also called an uh, uh, IPS, is just an additional layer of protection. The firewall inspects the TCP packet headers, uh, but the intrusion prevention performs a deep packet inspection. It reads the packet's header and data portion. Then those are compared to signature that are stored in a database that's maintained by uh, Semantic. And the signature database is updated automatically and downloaded to the SEPA. Uh, in addition to these technologies, the last thing you see on the screen there is Semantic Insight. Uh, some of these technologies are improved by this. This uh, Insight is a reputation-based uh, technology. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So let's move on to the demo. I'm going to just give me a moment here to switch screens. I'm going to be going over to uh, uh, a virtual environment where I have SEP running. 
Okay, let's take a look at the semantic endpoint protection. When you think about endpoint protection and endpoint security, the first thing you have to think about is what are you protecting against? And to get a better understanding of how SEP can add value to your organization, it's important to first understand the threat landscape. The, a lot of the security trends these days are uh, showing that web attacks and identity theft, uh, new zero-day vulnerabilities, all that stuff is on the increase. None of this is new. Uh, we know all that. Uh, with the increased use in mobile phones and tablets, other mobile devices, uh, uh, the, the uh, laptops, um, they're all on the Internet and they're used for data transmission, so mo mobile vulnerabilities vulnerabilities have also increased and they're getting more sophisticated all the time. So add that to the problem that we have always had with uh, malicious activity and it's unknown to the computer user. Uh, next thing you know they're, they're part of a botnet and these things are all done more and more uh, for money. It's all being monetized. All this stuff is available to the highest bidder. So traditional antivirus software and file-based protection are sometimes not enough to protect the users against all these threats. And in some cases, uh, even technologies like uh, IPS are circumvented. So reputation-based technologies like the semantic insight that I just spoke of and sonar are needed more and more to catch a lot of these threats. So obviously the threat landscape is something that's moving very, very fast and uh, there, there's a number of reports that come out on an annual basis. Semantic puts out one, uh, Verizon puts out another one. They're, they're both very good reports. But when you look at those, uh, there's some disturbing things that come to light. One of them is that the number of attacks from 2010 to 2011, 2011 is the last year the, for which the data is available. There was something like a, a, a two billion uh, number of increase in attacks. So that's a lot. And these are mostly triggered by vulnerabilities. And uh, the increase in vulnerabilities has risen to over 4,900 from 2010 to 2011. So if it's not 4,900 vulnerabilities, there's 4,900 more vulnerabilities. And it's, uh, of course, we all know one of the first things that you have to do in a, in a security posture is to keep your uh, systems patched. And that's, you know, sometimes really difficult to do. Uh, for a lot of reasons, um, every enterprise has their own reasons for maybe not being able to keep up with patching. And they're all good reasons. They're all very sound business reasons. So it's very difficult to do. But we're going to show you how hopefully with semantic endpoint protection that you'll be able to uh, uh, circumvent some of the, the need to do that on a, on a more regular basis and you'll be covered until you can get to that patching. So let's get started. When you first start uh, semantic endpoint protection, this is what you see. Uh, you see the, uh, the manager and the home screen. Uh, very quickly across the top, uh, and common tasks. This is just a drop-down menu. You'll be able to do some very uh, common things that you might do on a regular basis. I'm going to go through each one of these these tabs on the on the left-hand side, uh, and then uh, we'll discuss each one of them. Hopefully, we'll have enough time. I'm trying to keep this to under 30 minutes. So on the home screen, what we show here is the uh, on the left-hand side security status. It's going to show either good or needs attention. Uh, you can control uh, under the preferences, you can control what the combination of factors and whatever threshold you need that determines the security status uh, when it shows up. Uh, when the security status shows attention needed like it does right here, we can click on the view details and here's a linked list of the indicators that you can check out to see uh, what thing is not within acceptable limits. And in this case, I happen to know if I scroll all, all the way to the bottom, it's the content failure for sonar and unknown device failure. Back up to the top, these are all links. So I can, I can click and jump right to it. This is just an anomaly within the, the virtual environment. I left it this way. I didn't correct these things so that you could see exactly what was going on. So underneath the security status, you got endpoint status. This shows the total number of clients 
and the number of clients with definitions that are up to date and out of date, whether they're offline or whether they're disabled. It can also show the number of computers that need restarting. Uh, if a client had software that was recently upgraded, it would need to be restarted. In this case, we're showing zero. Over to the right side, we got license status, and that shows uh, the validity of the license. And if it uh, if an expiration date was coming up, it would show that. Underneath that, the security response. This shows the top threats and the latest threats, and this comes directly from semantic security response. And the threat con security level gives you an overall view of uh, global security, the current state of it. Uh, underneath that is virus and risk activity. It shows a number of viruses uh, and other risks that have been detected and what action was performed on those. Again, we're in a virtual environment here. There's not much going on. And underneath that is the favorite reports. This can be customized to do the reports that are most often used. And you can display that on your home screen. Moving over to monitors, the monitor page has near real-time charts and tables, and you can use that to monitor your network. The main difference between monitors and the tab right underneath that reports is that the statistics on the monitor page refresh more quickly and are used daily. The reports on the, uh, on the reports page are done less frequently, and it usually contains more detail. I'll show you that in just a second here. From the monitor page, you can display a summary of scans, risks, errors, uh, and attacks. Uh, detailed uh, uh, event information includes computer IP, um, the domain name, whether the computer was infected, if it needs a restart, and so forth. Uh, the logs tab shows you uh, which uh, computers are running a scan. The command status shows which uh, displays the status of commands that have been run on uh, individual endpoints from the SEPM, the, the endpoint manager. And the last one, notifications are messages. You can configure that to alert you about potential security problems. You can configure different kinds of events to trigger notifications, like when a new risk is detected or, or when new software package is installed on a client. So going down to the reports page, I'm, I'm kind of going through these I apologize, fast. I, I apologize for that. I'm, I'm a little under the gun here for time. The reports page, you can use that to uh, run and view and, and print uh, reports that you can schedule on a regular basis. Uh, you can do uh, reports in two ways. You can do a quick report on the top, uh, top tabs. They're quick report, are printable reports, and they're like available on demand. And then the schedule reports, uh, they run at a let me click on that real quick. They run at a at defined time and are run on, based on certain criteria. And then usually the result is that they're sent off to, uh, uh, emailed off to whoever you want, uh, whether it's a system administrator or uh, someone in management, whatever. The policies page and the next one, the clients uh, page, we're going to get back to these at the end. These are kind of the meat of everything. Uh, the policy page is where you manage policies that are downloaded to the client. On this page, the policies page uh, in the upper uh, left side here uh, lists the different types of policies like the, this virus and spyware, firewall, etc. Yeah, underneath that, the policies component menu, let me just expand that a minute for you. The policies component lists all the components that a policy can use. For example, if you had a firewall policy, uh, that policy might uh, require a specific network adapter, and then you would choose that from the components. Underneath that is the tasks pane, and this will show uh, appropriate tasks for the policy that you select in the in the right side under view policy. So, right now, uh, if I choose a virus and spyware policy, you'll see that the task pane changes. So that's, uh, those are the things that I can do with that particular policy. If I choose a firewall policy, for example, and then choose that policy, I don't have all of the same uh, options. So it's appropriate to which policy is chosen. And then, of course, uh, in the policy pane where, where I just was, uh, you can uh, change, add, edit. Uh, this, this is where you do the, the work on the actual policy. 
The clients page is used to manage the computers on your network. Uh, this shows the groups that are in the client uh, structure and they're arranged hierarchically and by default the group, the top group, my company and default group are included. Uh, if your company is small and you only need one group, you can assign all your clients to the default group. But if you need more groups, you can add more groups and that's what I've done here. So you can see marketing, uh, finance, and sales, and then underneath sales, we've got even more groups, and then we've kind of split that out into desktops, laptops, and servers. You don't have to uh, uh, set up your hierarchy this way. It can be uh, role-based as this is, or it could be geographical. Whatever works best for your company. Just as well as this is uh, finance, marketing, and sales, it could say uh, New York, Chicago, LA. So uh, it, you can set this up in any way that makes sense uh, for your company. So underneath that, again, the tasks uh, pane, it looks very much like what we just saw in the policy. And that's where you perform the actions when you're working on uh, uh, groups with clients. So again, if I choose the desktop, you'll see that the tasks that are available there change uh, the desktop group actually has some clients assigned to it, uh, which you see there in the right-hand side. So the clients, uh, on the right-hand side here, the clients, uh, excuse me, the, the, um, the group, group view shows four different tabs across the top. It's the clients, policies, and details, and the install packages. So the clients tab shows you which clients are within a specific group. In this case, I've got desktop and Again, it's a virtual environment, so there's only uh, a few machines here, but there's one machine that's named Win7. Uh, we can see that it's online. Uh, the last time the status was changed was just this morning, just a, a few minutes ago. If I jump down over into the client side on the servers, we'll see that we have two clients here. They're both online. Uh, one of them, the DC, is a domain controller. Uh, the other one is this machine, the uh, Cephalm SQL Server. The next tab is the policies tab which shows which policies are uh, deployed to the clients in this particular group. So in this case these are the policies that are applied to the server. If I go back to the desktop we could look at desktop uh, policies that are applied there. You'll notice that in this particular pane this, check, uh, this box is checked inherit policies so it's entirely possible that you apply one set of policies and it's propagated through your entire organization. Uh, the details page just tells you information about the group and again as you change groups you'll get different information uh, based on that. Here's the number of computers for desktops is one. If I go to servers there's actually two. Uh, no big deal there. The install package, uh, this tells you uh, which packages are available. You can customize install packages and as clients are added to the group, that would be the package that's used. So let's jump down to the admin page. The admin page is used to administer the accounts. And after the, the installation, you're going to see one administrator account. Uh, you can't delete this account, but you can rename it. Probably the better thing to do is to just add another account. And, uh, one of the things you can do, and we'll just uh, step through that real quickly here, if you add an administrator, the middle pane here is access rights. You can uh, uh, add administrators with different levels of privileges. Uh, it defaults to the limited administrator, and then underneath that you just choose which, uh, which rights they have access to, and then it steps down even further. For example, we'll choose manage policies. And then if I choose on policy rights, everything's enabled. Uh, but I can say, well, I want this particular manager to not be able to uh, change the exceptions policy, for example. And then I would just okay that. But we won't today. We're running out of time. So uh, let's go back to the policies page. I promised we'd get there. Uh, what I do want to talk about is one of the latest things that is uh, in, in SEP 12.1, and that's Insight. We talked about that earlier, and I promised we'd talk about it, so we're going to. Uh, Insight is... Uh, as a technology that allows for what semantics says conviction or exoneration, and I don't really like those words, but it's the best way to describe it. The conviction or exoneration of possible threats. 
and it's based on a community reputation. Uh, this technology, this insight, is used throughout the SEP environment with other technologies like uh, Insight Lookup, uh, Download Insight, and Sonar. And I'll get back to those in just a few minutes. Uh, this reputation data comes from Symantec, and it's uh, got it's based on over two million endpoints, and it consists of information on literally billions and billions of uh, of files that are uh, well unique executable files, and that includes the drivers, uh, DLLs, other executables, and this database is growing by about 30 million entries per week. So how does it how does it work? I mean, what's it all about? Insight, big deal. Tell me about it. Well, it's a little contextual in the in the sense that uh, two things are important to uh, Insight. One of them is prevalence. In other words, how many people in the world are using this file or have this file? And the other one is age. How old is this file? Is it a new file? Has it been around for a long time? Well, when you combine these two, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. The the benefits for using this is that you will have improved performance because we're going to skip known good files. I'll get to that in just a second. I'll tell you how that's uh, achieved. And we also increase our chance of discovering uh, new threats and new malicious files. So this has been around for a while since uh, the days of Norton 2007 and then later on with Norton Community Watch. But uh, Endpoint Protection 12.1 is the first version of SEP to take advantage of this insight. So this is what it does, uh, the technologies that leverage insight. Uh, one of them is Insight Lookup. Uh, I, I mentioned these before. Uh, we'll go over them again. This is a feature that can be enabled during your virus and spyware protection scans. It improves the performance by skipping files that are known to be good. And again, you can detect malware faster. Download Insight is a protection, a part of AutoProtect, and it provides additional protection. It, it checks files when they're being downloaded by the user, whether that's through a web browser or an instant messaging client or whatever. And Sonar is, again, a new technology available in SEP 12.1. If you're a SEP 11.x user, you may know it as TrueScan. It's very similar to that. It uses uh, uh, heuristics to identify malicious behavior. And of course, it incorporates the reputation data of Insight. Uh, the main difference is TrueScan used to run on a schedule, but Semantic runs all the time. Uh, if you have 11.x clients, they can be managed with a 12.1 SEPL. Just want to throw that out there. So here's what happens. When a request for the reputation for data is, is made, it's made directly to semantic reputation servers, and those are out on the internet. The semantic maintains these, they host them, everything. The local cache on the client is initially populated after the client searches itself for files, and then the reputation data is retrieved from the semantic servers. It's cached on the client so that it's not going out there. You, you can minimize future bandwidth. And the data is able to be used by all of the technologies in the, uh, in the set product. So how it works, uh, I touched on this earlier, Insight Data, uh, excuse me, the Insight Database uh, scores the, the executables and the applications according to what we talked about earlier, the, the context, the age of the file and, and the availability. How many customers are, have seen this file? And then files are placed in a rating system and it identifies them on a, on a scale from good and trusted to unknown and unproven and all the way to known malicious files. And the action that the SEP takes depends on the category of file. So the good files those are automatically cleaned, no scanning is required. The unproven files, uh, for most of the features that use it, they're scanned as normal. Download protection, uh, can you can actually configure what action you want to take. And let me show you that real quick. Here's download protection, and here's the action. So for unproven files, here's the action that you can take, and there are the, uh, the choices. You can just 
leave it alone, or ignore it, or you know, delete it, whatever you want to do. So the uh, there's a good side and a downside to this. So the uh, the here is uh, where you, there's a slider scale where you can uh, set the sensitivity of the reputation data. A higher sensitivity means that only known files to be only only files that are good are allowed to run. But the the downside is you have the possibility of false positive. If you set it at a lower setting, down to the minimum side, uh, false positives are mitigated a great deal. However, more files are going to be considered to be unproven. So this is just a, a simple slider scale, like we just talked about. What this uh, another technology that's used in this, and what I think a lot of people are interested in, is, is a virtual environment. And uh, I, I like to tell you about how this is also leveraged in the virtual environment. But before we do. I want to take a minute and, and talk about some of the, the challenges that you'll find in a virtual environment. Uh, protection scanning is, uh, performs identical operations repeatedly. And many times the same files are checked for a problem and a vast majority are found to be free of infection. So this is where insight really comes in handy. In a virtual environment, the result of this repetitive and and uh, constant or simultaneous scanning on a number of virtual machines is that the, the shared resources are just, just hammered. They're pushed to their limits and user performance degrades and it just gets to be absolutely unacceptable. And the, the simultaneous high uh, level resource usage is referred to as an AV storm or an antivirus storm. And the couple techniques you can use to uh, to avoid these AV storms is in using two techniques. Uh, one of them that CEP uses is the randomization of the scan to distribute the load. So CEP will uh, implement a randomized scan schedule and let me show you where that's set up. Uh, randomized scan schedule and that it spreads the load out so it, it's, it's the randomization helps to spread the load out. It doesn't reduce the load it just spreads it out. The same number of files are still checked. The, the VMs are just starting at different times. Uh, the other technology you can do is to actually reduce the number of files that need to be scanned. That's where the insight comes in and in, uh, in SEP for a virtual environment we have what's known as the shared insight cache. That was also introduced in this, uh, the, this uh, version of SEP 12.1 and that maintains, uh, the, the shared insight cache maintains a list of locally scanned files that are known to be free of viruses or security threats. Uh, after the file is listed in the, the shared insight cache, other set virtual clients can skip scanning that file and that reduces the demands on system resources. So that's the one that really comes in handy. Uh, by some accounts, this can uh, to save you something like 80% of your... So getting back to the Shared Insight Cache, it's a standalone server that manages the Shared Insight Cache. Uh, it runs independently of SEP, but you have to configure the SEP on the manager to specify the location of the, the Shared Insight Cache so that your clients can communicate with it. And the list of clean files is memory resident, so it's pretty scalable, up to thousands of virtual clients per shared insight cache. Now, the files are keyed off a file hash and a definition version that's used to scan the files. So if a set virtual client with a later definition version might be required to scan the file even though it already exists in the cache. It's something to be aware of. So when a set client is running on a virtual machine and it finds a file that needs to be scanned, uh, just like in a physical environment, the client queries the shared insight cache uh, server and when it's found, well if, if, if it's not found at all, the sub client scans a file and sends the results to the cache. If the file is not infected or a threat, uh, the cache whitelists a file by writing the file hash and the definition into the, into the cache. If a record is found, the SEP client queries the cache for the latest information and the cache then can return the hash and definition version and sends that information back to the client. As long as the hash is the same and the definition version is the same uh, on the cache, then it's going to be fine. 
if a newer definition is found, that means that a scan of the file is required, and then if it's clean, a new entry will be added to the cache. So while we're take, while we're talking about the SEP environment, let's let's let me take a few minutes to talk about some other virtualization features that are found in SEP 12.1. Uh, to improve the uh, performance in a virtual environment. And one of them is known as the virtual image exception. The virtual image exception, uh, again, introduced in 12.1, it gives the ability to exclude files from scanning that are part of a base image in a virtual environment. The virtual image exception is a standalone command line application. There's really not a whole lot to install there. Uh, the administrators uh, often maintain uh, base images of images that are used to build uh, virtual machines that are distributed throughout the environment. And the, uh, the image exception tool works perfectly for those environments because the virtual clients can be told to avoid scanning files that exist on the base image. And as long as those files haven't been modified, it's gold. It greatly reduces the load on system resources, especially disk I.O. Uh, as, as well as CPU. Uh, another uh, technology is the semantic uh, offline image scanner. That's kind of a mouthful. That enables administrators to scan and detect malware in offline uh, VMDK files. Uh, it runs on Windows and scans FAT32 and NTF file systems. Uh, it might work on other uh, file systems, uh, but it's only supported for the Windows FAT32 and NTFS. So uh, no guarantees there. This, uh, this uh, offline image scanner, uh, again, is, it's a portable application, doesn't require installation in the traditional sense, and it has no dependency on any other semantic software other than just the antivirus. And so it reports, uh, excuse me, it supports antivirus definitions for uh, 11x, 12x, and semantic antivirus 10. And those are the only ones. I know this is going to come up. If we look at the policies for a particular client, one of the settings is a live update settings. Someone's uh, invariably going to ask this question, so I'm going to head it off right now. Someone's going to say, how do we, uh, how do we maintain or how do we make sure that all the endpoint clients have the latest definitions? And how, what's the mechanism that's involved there? Well, usually what happens is uh, I'll start from the top, the, the SEPM, the, the Semantic Endpoint Manager, gets updates from Semantic Live Update Server. Those are on the internet. Uh, then the SEPM controls uh, distributing those updates out to all the clients. Now there's a, a potential problem when you have a geographically uh, diverse environment. Uh, for example, earlier I said that the, this uh, this hierarchy of finance, marketing, and sales could just as easily say uh, Boston or New York, Chicago, and LA. So if the SEPM were located in Chicago, do all the clients from New York and LA have to connect back to the SEPM to get the updates? Well, they don't have to. A better way to do that would be to uh, deploy what's known as a group update provider, also known as a GUP. And uh, that's a, a feature that's inherent on every client installation. All you have to do is declare one of the clients to be a GUP. And what happens then is that at the remote offices, the GUP is the only machine that connects back to the SEPM for content update. And then all the clients in the local area are configured to go to the GUP for their updates. So that's a way to uh, cut back on bandwidth. I'm sure that's a question that everybody had. Okay, I hope uh, if I've done it right, I've had technical difficulties before, but the end screen shows my name, shows my email address, and my phone number. I hope that everyone can see that. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. The best way to do it is going to be through my email address. If you already have a relationship with the consultant or anyone here at ITS, feel free to contact them. We're not too terribly proud. And if there's any questions you have at all, please, please don't hesitate to contact us. So thank you very much. I went way over the half hour, and I apologize for that. I hope everyone has a good day, and please be safe. We'll see you later. Thank you.